Okay, let's start over. Good morning. morning. (laughs) It's good to see everybody here this morning. Let's all stand and let's do our memory verse. Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Psalm 34, 19. Let's go to our great God in prayer. Father, how we thank you for this day, how we thank you for your grace in our lives, how we thank you for the privilege we have to gather together around your word, to sing your praises, and to allow your spirit to speak to us. Lord, we do pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to hear your word, and Lord, that we would be willing to be obedient to what you teach. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. We have a special for you this morning. so great, but somehow with the organ and the piano like that, I feel like saying amen instead of amen. Uh, We don't know why. Let's all stand again, and let us turn, well, I'm going to read from Psalm 119. The psalmist writes and says, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness, they walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I will give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Remain standing as uh, the band comes and we sing a couple uh, praise songs to him.
I think we all could agree that this year has been kind of challenging, right? I think we all could agree that life is really challenging. But for those of us that believe, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Our God is holy. He's almighty. And no matter what we go through, we look around and we see that the earth is absolutely filled with his glory. So let's open this song service with Holy is the Lord. build their life on something or someone. We see that scripture tells us that we need to build our life on our holy, awesome Savior. He's our rock, and he's our foundation. And what a great way to build a life is on our great, holy Savior. So we're going to sing, Build My Life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside.
beginning to think we need to put traffic lights up here on the platform. Let's pray. Lord, now we come to your beautiful, marvelous, wonderful, truthful word that gives life and direction and instruction for those who obey. Open our hearts. Allow your spirit to teach us. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we open the Word of God this morning, I think sometimes we miss what we're doing here. We don't just read the Scriptures to fill time or to give us a jumping in point. But we need to be aware that when we open the scriptures, God is going to speak to you. These words that come to us from the scriptures are the pure word of God. They come from his own heart and from his own voice, and they command our attention. Listen as we read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Paul says, To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is what we would call a prayer report. Now, Paul's letters are full of prayers. You cannot read one of his epistles without finding him just stopping in the middle of what he is writing and breaking off into a prayer uh, for the people that he is writing to. And Paul is telling the Thessalonians here, This is how I pray for you. He is telling them the nature of his prayer for them. And as you look at this prayer, you come to the conclusion that he is praying for the right stuff. The right things. Sadly... Many of our prayers are directed towards the wrong stuff. Most of the times, Christians are directed at the wrong things to pray for. And many times we pray selfishly and in regard only to ourselves and to those that we love for somewhat shallow things. If you're guilty like I am, how many times have we prayed, Lord, please bless me? He blesses us every day without having to ask him to bless us. The mere fact that we're walking and and talking and and living and, and, and have another day to serve him is a blessing from God. The fact that we have clothes on our backs and food to eat and a place to live is a blessing from God. And every day God blesses us and yet we spend so much time saying, Lord, bless me. It's usually because we think we need some things that we don't really need, but we want them anyway. 
Our prayers are often short-sighted. They don't view the long picture of what life is to be all about. We have a tendency to pray for health and happiness and success and personal benefit and comfort, for solutions to fix all of the little problems of our lives so that everything just goes smoothly all the time and there's never any waves, for a healed body or a home or food or a job or a car or a husband or a wife or a promotion or more money. And yet this is not what Paul teaches us to pray for. Now, while these things certainly are a part and, and make up a part of life, understand that they are very, very low on the Apostle Paul's priority list. They're also pretty low on the list of Jesus Christ. He tells us over in Matthew chapter 6, he says, do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You see, what Jesus is saying to us, what he is telling us, is that in our prayer life, our responsibility is to seek the kingdom and God's glory. It's about him, not necessarily about us, because he knows the things we have need of. Matter of fact, he, he knows them before you even know that you need them. And he's a good father. Jesus says our Heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts to his children. James says every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights of whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Or uh, I like the translation, no shifting shadows. God is not fickled. He goes, he, he doesn't go, whoa. Acock had a bad thought today, so you know what? I'm just not going to let him have lunch this afternoon. It doesn't work that way. But James does give us more insight into the matter when he says in chapter 4, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Motives. Motives. So very often we are not only praying for the wrong things, but we are praying for the wrong reasons. And as we look into the insight of this prayer of Paul, a man who prayed for the right stuff and the right reasons. And verse number 11 in our text tells us what the right stuff is. Look what he says. To this end we pray for you that God will count you worthy of your calling, fulfill every desire for goodness, and the work of faith with power. And he tells us the reasons that he prays these things for us. So that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I suppose, not making, wanting to make anybody feel bad. Well, that's not true. <laughs> but I should ask you, what do you pray for? What do you pray for? When it comes down to you and your life and your family people who are in your world, the people you love, your church, what do you pray for? What do you pray for? What do you desire for yourself, for your wife, for your kids? What do you really want God to do? 
Let's just suppose. What if God showed up at your door one day and said, I want to give you three wishes. You say, Dave, that sounds more like Aladdin than it does the Bible. But what if he did? He said, here's three wishes. Whatever you ask for, I will do. Now, I can see some of the wheels turning already because you're going, oh, boy, would I like that to happen. Do you have the right values? Do you have the right priorities? You see, we live in a world that is skewed in a world that is deviated, deviate, one that knows little of true value. We are bombarded every single day and told how we cannot live without this and how we should think this way and how we should do that and how this is how you are successful and this is what life is all about. We live in a world where people want all the wrong stuff. And that massive, overpowering pursuit of things that mean nothing and should mean nothing to us this attitude of the most worldly people in terms of their pursuit, bombards us every single day. And the sad thing is, so many times we fall for the lie. And we are consumed with it. I read a short story this week. It's called The Bet by Anton Chekhov. And Anton's uh, little story here talks about how skewed people's values really are. And he was a Russian writer that wrote in the 1800s. And uh, this story gives you the value system of most people even alive today. And the plot involves a wager between two men. Uh, a group of Russians were meeting at the house of a rich banker. And they were talking about which was better. To be executed or to spend all of their life in solitary confinement. And they argued back and forth, you know, this. And, and uh, the banker said, no, if you're executed, it's all done, it's over, and, and, and that's it. And, and there was a, a young lawyer there, about 25 years of age, and he says, no, even though you are in solitary confinement, at least you're still alive. And the banker looked at him and said, I bet you two million rubles that you couldn't last five years in solitary confinement. And the lawyer said, I'll take that bet, but in order to prove to you that I can do it, I'll not live in solitary confinement for five years. I'll live in solitary confinement for 15 years for that two million rubles. And so they made the arrangements for them to uh, what they were going to do. And on the banker's property, uh, there was a, a, a cottage that was there. And they set it all up. And, and the requirements were this, that he was to have no contact whatsoever with any other human being. He could write letters. He could read books. He could eat whatever kind of food that he wanted. But if he ever walked out of the threshold of that house, he lost the bet. And the banker said, you're crazy. 
He said, you're going to lose the best part of your life. But he said, you know what? I'll have so much of life left over. And I'll never have to worry about another thing. And so they put him in this cottage. He was observed by guards, but he couldn't see them. His food was served every day through a slot under the door. And he could have anything he wanted. All he had to do was write the request and send it, and it would be delivered with the food tray. The first thing he asked for was a piano. And in that first year, a year and a half, he learned how to play the piano and to play all of the classics. And, and it was beautiful to hear the music coming out of that house. And then uh, he began reading, and he got all kinds of the modern novels and the things of the day, and to read them and all of those things for the next five or six years. And then he asked for a New Testament. And he spent two years studying the New Testament and reading it. And after that, he asked for books on the theology and philosophy and, and, and all of these things, learning about what he has read uh, in the New Testament and what was going on there. And it came down to the last week of the 15 years. And as uh, the banker was thinking about that, the tide has kind of turned on him, and he didn't uh, know what he was going to do. His debt was greater than his assets, and he was thinking, what am I going to do? What is going to happen in all of this? Because I'm going to go, and I'm going to have to pay him $2 million. And so he began to think about it. And he began to think about what he was going to say and, and how he could do this. And so he decided that he was going to kill the lawyer. And on the night before he was to go free and to get his $2 million, it was a rainy night and the banker took a knife from the kitchen and he made sure that the guard wasn't there because of the rain. He was probably off sleeping somewhere. And he looked in through the slot and he saw the man sitting at the table with his head down. And he thought, man, this guy has aged 50 years and 15 years. He was emaciated and skinny and, 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 and the skin just kind of hung off of his flesh and he was pale and, and everything and his head was down and, and the banker tried to be very quiet and sneaking in there and then realized that he was asleep at the table. And as he walked in, he noticed a letter. On the desk. And he picked the letter up. And this is what it said. Tomorrow at 12 noon, I will be free. But before leaving this room, I find it necessary to say a few words to you. With a clear conscience and before God who sees me, I declare to you that I despise freedom and life and health, health and all of your books called the joys, called the joys of this world. I know I am wiser than you all, and I despise your books. I despise all earthly blessings and wisdom. All is worthless and false, hollow and deceiving, like a mirage. You may be proud, wise, and beautiful, but death will wipe you away from the face of the earth as it does the mice that live beneath your floor. And your heirs and your history, and your moral geniuses, immoral geniuses will burn with the destruction of the earth. You have gone mad and are not following the right path. You take falsehood for truth and deformity for beauty. To prove to you how much I despise all that you value, I renounce the two million on which I looked at one time as the opening of paradise for me, and which I now scorn. And to deprive myself of the right to receive the two million, I will leave my prison five hours before the appointed time 
and by so doing, break the terms of our compact and be signed his name. The banker put the letter back in place and quietly moved out of the room again and shut the door and went back to his house. Tears in his eyes, thinking about what his life was really all about. And Chekhov closes by writing, Never before, not even after sustaining serious losses, he, the banker, despised himself as he did that moment. His tears kept him awake the rest of the night, and at seven the next morning, he was informed by the watchman that they had seen the man crawl through a window, go to the gate, and disappear. You see, some people have to learn the hard way about life and what is important. And some people never learn what's truly important. And the Apostle Paul knew this. He knew that we can become so enamored with the things of this world that are going to dissolve and be done away with that that's what we build our lives upon instead of the truth of God's word. And so the Apostle Paul Is this to this end also we pray for you that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power three requests Paul prayed for those people number one he says I, I'm going to pray for your worthiness your worthiness in Christ he said, number two, I'm going to pray for your fulfillment, that you live a fulfilled life following after Jesus Christ. And then third, that I'm going to pray for your work of service, that it will be done with great power through the Spirit of God. Man, there's a lot in those three requests, aren't there? We could spend months on them. Don't worry, we're not just weeks and this is my prayer I pray that by the spirit of God he will help me to be able to unpack these verses for you that you will open your heart to the spirit and he will bring about change in your life so that you and I desire the right stuff The world is full of fools. Full of fools that spend their lives wasting away. And we make heroes out of them. As Chekhov said, some learn the hard way and some never learn at all. And we who know the Lord Jesus Christ and have the word need not to be fools. We don't need to waste our time trying to get what is ultimately of no value, but gaining what is priceless. Those three desires. Worthiness, fulfillment, and powerful service by the Spirit. You say, I can't wait to dig into them, Pastor Dave. Well, this is like one of those radio shows. Now, before we get to that, we have to look at something else. We have to consider the text from the perspective of prayer. You know, sometimes we get confused on, on what 
prayer is and how prayer is supposed to work. And we get confused about why am I praying for stuff when in the sovereignty of God and we get upset at the sovereignty of God and we think, oh, you know what? God is going to do it anyway, so why should I even pray about it? Well, we have to understand the purposes behind the prayer. And Paul says, here is my resource. To this end also we pray for you always. Prayer. Whatever it was that Paul wanted for them, he knew that it was only obtainable by prayer. Not human ingenuity. Not by some great program or uh, sleight of hand that makes us just want to feel good about ourselves and go away and not really think about the seriousness of life. Paul didn't turn to tricks and, and, and like he told the Corinthians, we are not ones who merchandise the word of God. This is what the word says. This is what you need to do, Period. But we're always trying to shift it. We're always trying to make it so that it applies to somebody else, but it doesn't apply to me. So Paul says, this is what I pray. And several things flow out of this little sentence here. Number one, the apostle Paul prayed for his people. Second of all, he prayed for them all the time, always praying for you. And third of all, in praying for them, he had a goal in mind. It wasn't just bless the missionaries and bless the flowers and bless this. I'm praying so that there is change, sanctification coming about in your life that will make you more like Jesus Christ. Christ, because that's the goal in life, folks, for us. To be like him. He is showing himself to be a faithful pastor. Now, say a couple things here. I hope you don't take them wrong. In Acts chapter 6, verse number 4, we're giving the responsibility and the job of what a pastor, a shepherd, is to do. And here the apostles looked to the people and they said, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's why Pastor Bob and I are here. Our responsibility before our great God and to our people, to you, is to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Those who shepherd the flock of God, we need to remember this. And especially coming out of this pandemic or in the middle of this pandemic, is that we've kind of strayed from this idea to thinking that, you know, the pastoral staff is here to do the things that we don't want to do, like paint and clean and fix and repair and, and those things. Folks, this is not our job. This is not our church or my church. It is our church, and we all bear a responsibility to do these things so that we can do the things that God has called us to do. And I've learned that during these last five months. And it's not saying that we don't do anything, that you have to do it all. 
But the reason we do repair and clean and paint is that is because we love the church, not because it's our job. And two or three people can't do it. God has blessed us. We don't have to pray for God's blessing. He's blessed us. We have seven acres of property debt free. We have tremendous building. Cameras, lights, action. I feel like I'm in Hollywood. (laughs) And seven acres of property with two buildings on it cannot be done by two pastors, a janitor, and a few trustees. Because the time that we have to dedicate to those things, we cannot do the things we've been called to do. And you know who that affects? It affects you. It affects this church and the reach to the community and all that we want to see God do in our church. And yet we become content. Oh, as long as the doors are open, that's all that matters. No, it doesn't. What matters is is that you are growing in grace and in sanctification and in obedience to Jesus Christ and that you are so in love with Jesus Christ that you want to share him with your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers to see them come to Christ. We're not here just for social reasons. We are here to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the way that we accomplish our part in your sanctification is to pray for you that God will sanctify you and teach you. And so that's what I do. I teach you the truth that sanctifies. Say, well, Pastor Dave, you're making me feel a little bit uncomfortable. You should feel uncomfortable. Because if you feel uncomfortable, the Spirit of God is saying, you know what? You need to make some changes to become more like your Savior. You need to commit yourself to following Him completely, not half-heartedly. You need to surrender your will to my will. And be obedient. You see, that's what the truth is supposed to do. It is supposed to confront us with what God wants and what we want and make the right choice. So here's the pattern of prayer for us as your shepherds. This is what I pray. I pray for your sanctification to grow, to change, to become more like Jesus Christ. I pray for your maturity. Like the Apostle Paul said, that you will not always be like little children tossed to and fro uh, with every wind and wave of doctrine, not knowing what you believe or why you believe it, not uh, living by your flesh and flying off the handle if things don't go your way, but that you are mature and able to handle life. I pray for your growth. That you would grow that you would spend time in God's word, that you would allow him to change you so that you can develop spiritually. It doesn't just happen, folks. There's no magic formula that goes on that, you know, I'll sleep with the Bible under my pillow at night and, and then I'll be a spiritual person when I wake up in the morning. It doesn't work that way. It takes time and effort I'm a busy person. 
if you're too busy to spend time in God's Word every day, you're too busy. Period. When you come to the end of your life, your stuff is not going to comfort you. When you come to the end of your life, all of the things that you have amassed are not going to mean a hill of beans. When you come to the end of the life, the thing as a believer that you will cling to and hold on to is the word of God and its truth. But if you're not in the word, how are you going to know what to hold on to? How are you going to know the precious promises that have been given to us? How do you know the hope that is ours in Christ? Because it is only found in one place, his word. This is how Paul prayed. And this is how he taught them the word. And that is my twofold responsibility. And such prayers are common in his letters. And he wanted them to know that he was praying for them. You know, there are only brief times that we can teach. Right now, it's Sunday mornings at 1030 and, and Bible studies and Wednesday night uh, videos that we do. But I tell you, there's unlimited times to pray. And the prayer life of the shepherd must be a constant thing. And I may not always be on my knees or have my hands folded and my eyes closed, and that really doesn't work when you're driving in your car. But there is seldom a waking moment when I'm not praying for one of you. These things. These things. See? When the sheep are on my heart, they are then carried to the heart of God. And the prayer of sanctification for God's people is a way of life. And Paul says, I want these things for you. And the resource that I tap, and the only way it's going to happen is if God does something in your life. I go to God, and I see a wonderful balance here. I know I must teach the word of God because the only way that you know how to obey is to obey what the word of God teaches, to be sanctified. Yet it is God alone who prompts that obedience. I can't make you obey because I can't change your heart. I don't know your heart. But God does. And you have to be open to that. So there has to be that tension that is there that must be maintained in our hearts and in our minds that says, if I am going to be a sanctified, growing in Christ-likeness, holy, changed by the Spirit, Christian, it demands that I obey the Word of God, period. No excuses, no trying to rig it up to make it say what you want it to say, but just to obey. And that's where we'll pick up next week to deal with this tension that is there between our prayers and the sovereignty of God in our lives. But I say to you this morning, I plead with you, desire the right things. Desire the things that God wants in your life. 
your sanctification, your maturity, your growth, your development spiritually, that you can be the man or lady that God wants you to be. And I guarantee you, it will change your life. It will change it. For the glory of Christ. Oh, and by the way, announcement. It's not going to be easy. Every time you decide you're going to take a stand for Christ, the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to fly at you like nobody's business. And you'll either stand on the grace of God or fall without it. Paul said it this way. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray. Lord, you have known my heart this morning. You know the hearts of everyone that is here. You know where each and every person is at in their walk with Christ. And Lord, we can say that we're here or we're there. We can fool each other, and many times we fool ourselves, but we do not fool you. So, Lord, I pray this morning that just maybe there's some people here this morning who will commit to being a complete follower of Jesus Christ. The old song says, I have decided to follow Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me, Though no one join me, still I'll follow. Might that be our cry? Might our lives be changed this week because we have spent time in your word, that we have dedicated ourselves to be obedient, that we have spent time conversing with you and praying for the right stuff. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Let's all stand. Why don't we sing that chorus? Everybody's flipping through. We're a little short-handed this morning with people on vacation and things. You know it. I have decided to follow Jesus. Here we go. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. 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 No turning back.
Lord, bless this day that we may walk in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you need the announcements, they're on the website. Because I don't have them. We're dismissed. May the Lord bless you throughout this day.